Hey, y'all. Hey, it's JJ Conway. Welcome to Building Wealth Together, where our goal is to help you walk in abundance and leave a legacy. It's Wealth Building Wednesday, where we answer your money questions with style and grace. To ask your question, go to buildingwealthtogether.com and click Ask JJ or leave a voicemail at 1 833 4 Ask JJC. Let's get into it. The first question I had come in this is one of my favorite questions to answer. This is a business finance question. So you can ask a personal finance question or you can ask a business finance question. OK, so this one's a business finance question. And the question is, what should I hire first as I'm expanding my business? And the reason I love this question is because nobody ever believes me. And I didn't believe my first mentor that told me this until I did it in my life. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you've got a business that you're building, you've got a side hustle that's growing into something more, right? Uh, or you re- you know, you've got your sights set on it, or even in your career, like some careers, you're, you're rising up in the ranks and you want to take on a personal assistant, or you maybe want to take on, you know, somebody for, for, greater branding and visibility, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that you might consider the very first position that you might hire to be domestic help. And by domestic help, I mean somebody to take care of the cleaning, maybe somebody to take care of the meal planning and the cooking and to free up your time at home to spend time with your family and time with yourself so that you can be your most productive you when it comes to running your business. See, I I had thought that, oh, I need to go out and get an assistant to do this and this, and I need to go hire these people to do this and hire these people to go do that. But really, you know what I needed as I first started growing my business? I needed breathing room. And I'll tell you what else I needed. I needed to not work a full-time day job being active duty in the military and a full-time ministry and a full-time side hustle and then spending time with my kids. And if my husband was in town, spending time with him. And then when I finally get a minute to myself, it's time to wash the dishes and clean the house. How many of you out there, you finally get an opportunity, especially moms, you finally get an opportunity for a couple hours alone and and you're, and you're choosing between clean or sleep. Okay. So as you're building your business, that's something you definitely want to look into. Okay. All right. Next question. Let's see what this next question is. We're struggling to put away a thousand dollars away in savings. Okay. So let me, before I read the rest of this question, let me talk about what that's about today. Okay. So when somebody new comes to me, one of the recommendations that I make is depending on their income, that they establish a savings account. So if you're very low income, I might recommend $500. I really like people to get at least a thousand because a thousand covers most of what can get wrong. But if you're at a higher level of income, or if you have like different real estate properties and things like that, and your business hasn't grown enough to be able to cover what happens with them, then I might recommend more. In fact, if you are somebody who invests in real estate and you don't have enough in your retained earnings in that in account that you use for your business, I would recommend at least six or seven thousand dollars in your emergency fund, your personal emergency fund, until you can save that same equivalent up in your business emergency fund because a water main bust and you got to repair it, you know, and be concrete and everything. That's, that's $6,000 right there. You know, a roof is what five, 6,000, depending on who you get it from. Like, 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 like my friends can get a roof fix for three or $4,000. And then when it came time to get our roof repaired with the, with the the contractors and the insurance company was 18,000. And I'm like, um, all the investment work I've done, a roof is not that expensive. (laughs) But I guess it is when you've got a, a an insurance markup, right? But so you want to have you want to have money in the bank to cover the things that can go wrong because far too many of us get our future plans derailed by a busted tire. Get our plans and everything derailed by having to go into the doctor. Or we don't go into the doctor because we don't have any money for it. Okay. And so these are the kinds of things. I mean, we need health insurance as well, but these are the kinds of things that we really want to do. So with this particular person, um, their recommendation that uh, my recommendation for them is a thousand dollars and they're having, they're having trouble putting that away. And they're really, they're really having, 
really having uh, disagreements about how to raise the money fast. And so, <laughs> and so uh, one wants to sell the other's car and that one doesn't want to sell their car. And I'm kind of shortening the question a little bit because I don't want to give too many personal details. Right. Um, and then there's another part of this that's applicable to more people. So I'm actually going to answer that as a separate question. But when you can't, as a couple, when you can't figure out what to do, okay, then that's, then sometimes you can split the difference. You know, my, we, we got, look at that y'all. I quit working. I quit working for the military and, and, and apparently I, I now qualified for a stimulus check. Right. And so we got a stimulus check and me and my husband were like, well, what are we going to do with it? And he's like, well, I want to do this with it. And I was like, well, that's the whole thing. I want to do this with it. And so we just agreed to split it. Right. And we split it and we, and we're doing what we're going to do with it. And I encourage you to be intentional about that. That's what we're going to talk about Saturday. Be intentional about what you do with that. Make sure it's going to define your future and help your future. Right. But, but on a lot of things, when we're trying to get out of debt as a couple, and we're trying to create new habits and new patterns, we can't just split it down the middle because it's not just a split down the middle problem. It's not, I brought $30,000 of debt to this marriage and you brought $30,000 of debt to this marriage and I work 12 hours and you work 12 hours and we split all the bills down the middle. You know, we say things like that, but even when it's actually true and I haven't yet had any clients where everything was really truly equal in their marriage, we say that, but it doesn't end up that way. I mean, I'm not trying to be, oh, I just lost all my Facebook folks. <laughs> Somebody did not like where I was going with that one, man. That, that, that readership went, or that viewership went way down. But, but seriously though, it's very, it's very, very rare that you're actually going to have everything split down the middle. Okay. And so you can't make decisions by, split down the middle because what that really is, is that's avoidance. That's avoidance of the issue. Well, I'm just, we're just going to split this down the middle. You take care of your half and I'm going to take care of my half and you figure it out. Or, you know, one spouse, and, and I was guilty of this. This is, this is, this is me. Okay. So this is, this is how I wanted to solve our problem of me moving all my stuff into my husband's house. You get rid of all your stuff and we move all my stuff in. <laughs> It doesn't work like that. And, and it's really easy for one spouse to see all the, 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 the specks in the other spouse's eye, but not see the big old beam sticking out of their own eye. Okay. So we really have to come together. This is why I say money problems aren't always money problems. They're usually people problems. And so you guys are fighting over, over selling this car, but let's, let's stop fighting over something and trying to prove who's going to be right. And let's start fighting for your future. See, when we're fighting each other, I'm right and you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong. And either way, somebody is going to be unhappy. So we stop fighting each other and we start fighting for our future. So when you start fighting for now there's a common enemy. 10 years from now, we want to be financially free, don't we? That's right. So I'm fighting to get to a that's right with the person that is supposed to be helping me build my future. Okay. So I hope you get, I hope you get what I'm saying here in the context of resolving your money issues in your relationships. Okay. I'm not fighting my spouse. I'm not fighting my spouse. I'm fighting for my future. And when I'm fighting for my future, if, if my spouse wants me to sell my car and I don't really want to sell my car because I think he should sell his truck, well, then we have to discuss what is best for our future. Okay. So that's the shift that I would make in this particular situation. Okay. Now, a second part of this question, and this is one that I've got a couple questions on. And I love this question because I, I, I find that, um, before I knew how to answer this for myself, it was a mystery to me and it was always haphazard. And so it's about how do you know where to put in new money into the budget when new money comes in? And the way they're making this sound is that they're doing kind of like I do. And I, I'll admit I'm bad for this, y'all. I'm bad for this. I will, I will um, make the plan and make the budget and then extra money comes in. Oh, going shopping. 
<laughs> I'm going to go shopping. Oh, I'm going to go do this. Oh, I'm going to go do that. Oh, let's go to a trip. Oh, let's go eat. You know, I can, I, and this is where, this is where the Lord had told me I had to stop being so hypocritical because I could get real critical at the things that my husband might want to spend some money on. But the reality is we are two peas in a pot on that. When we like something or we want something and we have the money for it, we're going to go get it. Right. So, so I had to learn it just because the likes are different. Doesn't mean the pattern isn't different. All right. So, so, so you're mad about this, you're mad about that. And you got this money, you got that money and you're thinking it's different, but under the surface, it's the same behavior. You just got different likes. Okay. So when this extra money comes in, it's important to add it into the spend plan. Okay. Now, now there's two situations when we talk about extra money. Okay. One is you, you know, the money's coming before it comes. We add that to our allocated spend plan. Spend plan. We add that into our plan for what we're going to do with this money before we get it. This is why I'm telling everybody, be intentional about your stimulus check. You may not know how much you're going to get. And I think here's some, you can sit down with somebody and find out how much you're going to get. I honestly didn't look into it because I, I didn't think it was really going to happen. You know, bad financial planner me. Um, but you can, you can plan out, okay, if I'm getting this much, Here's what we're getting. If we get a little more, here's what we're getting. If we get a little more, here's what we're getting. And when you plan it like that, it's called an irregular spend plan. All in a regular spend plan is, is it's just a list of all the things you want to buy if you get the money to buy it. We have our set budget, our set spend plan with the money we know is coming in. If we get more money and we know we're getting it before we get it, then we spend that money on paper first. But if we, you know, somebody buys three classes tomorrow, and I got an extra $10,000 in my account. Well, I haven't planned for that. It showed up and I'm happy it showed up, right? I love it when it shows up. I, I love waking up to finding more money in my account, right? But I didn't plan for that, but I planned for that because I got me a list of all the things I want to implement in my business, or I've got a list of all the things I want to implement in my family or buy in my family or the programs I want to sign my son up for. You create that list. And when the money comes in, both on the business side and the personal side, when the money comes in, you got a plan. And when you have a plan, what it does is it keeps you from throwing that money away unawares by going shopping or doing whatever. And you didn't even realize that you were doing it. And all of a sudden it's gone. Okay. And so I'm not saying don't go shopping with that money, but you know, put it on your regular spend plan. Hey, if I make an extra $200 this month, I'm going shopping. It's my birthday. I'm going shopping. I get, I, I get an extra $500 this month. The first 200 going shopping the next 300 buying my son, whatever. Okay. So that's called an irregular spend plan. Very, very powerful technique. But if you know the money's coming in before you actually get it in your hands, then plan out what you're going to do with it. Just that act of being strategic. I'm telling you, it shifts the energy in your favor when it comes to money. The, the, one of the biggest differences between people who have money and people who don't have money is that people who have money and keep more of their money, they think strategically. They think long-term. They think, how am I going to make this work for me? Where am I going in my life? Where do I want to be? And how can the resources I have available to me get me there? Great question. Great question. How to prioritize what debts to tackle first. Now, I'm going to qualify my answer with this one with please understand that what I'm about to suggest is not mathematical, but the way I look at it, if any of us cared about math, we wouldn't have gotten in debt in the first place because debt brings interest. Interest brings a penalty, a penalty, the money that we didn't need to pay in the first place. It's like my example with the purse. You get your new Dooney, you put it on credit, you pay the minimum payment. Your $300 purse now turns into a $1,000 purse. But if you'd have just waited a couple months and saved up the $300, now you're not paying the minimum payments. Okay. And so, so we know that intellectually, but we don't do that. So if we don't do that, that's why I'm saying we're going to suspend the need to be mathematically correct for a minute. And we're going to do something that gets our behavior going in the right direction. Very simply, the way I recommend we prioritize debts. Okay. The very first thing that I recommend we prioritize is actually not a debt. It's called the four walls. Okay. We want to make sure we protect our, we pay for our housing. 
which includes our utilities. Okay. I don't want you paying off credit cards and you don't have any lights on in the house, any heat during winter. I want you to make sure you got a place to live. You've got water running. You've got electricity going. You've got transportation to get to work. You've got something to eat. Now I'm not talking about bison steaks every night, but I'm talking about good quality food. That's going to help you stay healthy while you get through this rough patch. Right? So, so there's the basics that we take care of. And then we worry about the debts. We take care of our four walls. And if we can afford to pay the minimums on our debts and our bills, we do that. If we take care of our four walls, but we don't have enough money to prioritize on our debts, then in that case, I recommend, I recommend you sit down with me first of all. Okay. But you can do your internet research. You don't really need to pay me for this. I know most of the people who come on for uh, fireside chat, they're, they're struggling. They don't have money for a financial coach right now. Although I think I'm worth it. Uh, I understand I've been there. You can Google this. It's called a pro rata letter and you're going to write, you're going to figure out how much you have left over. So let's say I made $700 this month and my rent is 400. And I need about a hundred to eat off of. Okay. And I need about 20 for gas because I'm, I'm not going anywhere extra. I don't have no money. Right. So now I'm up to $520 and that leaves me out of my 700 that I, that I made, that leaves me 180 left to pay bills with. Okay. Uh, and, and so if I owe, you know, if my minimum for Best Buy this month is a hundred and my minimum to Sears is a hundred and my minimum, let's get somebody else. My minimum to JC pennies is 300. I can't pay that. I only got 180 left. And see, I'm not going to pay Sears and JC Penney's and miss my mortgage, I miss my rent and get and get evicted, all right? I'm not going to do that. Um so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a letter to all my creditors and I'm going to say this is my bare bones basic budget. I only made six uh, seven hundred dollars this month. This is how much my rent was. This is how my basic utilities. This is the small amount for food. Here's all I have left over, and here is your fair share. I know I owe you this. I'm gonna pay you in full, but this is your fair share of what I have left over to pay bills with. And you're gonna send that letter every month until you're able to start paying in full. And I'm going to tell you after about month three or four, people are going to start being, they're going to start dropping fees and they're going to start working with you and dropping balances and stuff because they're going to see you're serious. See, the, I've only had one person who did this technique that did not, uh, that did not escape being sued. He actually did get sued. And when I asked him, I said, well, we drafted this letter for you. And he said, well, I didn't put my budget in. And I said, but you got to put your budget in because otherwise they think you're lying. Because guess what? Everybody's grandma goes into the hospital right before the big game. Everybody got a medical emergency right before Christmas. Everybody lost their job right before fill in the blank. And your creditors know that because they get thousands of letters and phone calls. Now they don't get letters. They get phone calls from people that say, I can't pay my bill this month because fill in the blank calamity. But really the reason they can't pay their bills because they wanted a big TV for the big game. They wanted new a uh, living room, dining room suite for Thanksgiving or for Christmas. Like your creditors know this. So you got to come correct when you cannot afford to pay your bills. All right. So that's that's situation two there. Okay. So we we're going through these situations and we're walking our way up. Okay. If you have enough money to cover your four walls and you have enough money to pay your minimum payments on all your bills, you pay your minimum payments on all your bills and you take everything that's left over after you got that savings account we talked about in the beginning, you take everything that's left over and you throw it at the smallest bill. I know. It's not the most mathematically uh, accurate way to do it sometimes. I get that. But there's something psychological about knocking out that smallest bill. Okay. And remember, if we cared about math, we wouldn't be in debt in the first place because all debt does is make the bankers rich and it keeps us poor. All right. So, so we, um, I know some of you can be like, oh, I could leverage debt. Okay. Well, I got a lot of, I got a lot of real estate investors who are hating life right now with COVID. So don't even talk to me about debt. I like to invest without debt. All right. So anyway, I'll get off that soapbox. But so, so you pay the minimums on everything and the extra you have left over, you 
throw it all at the smallest one till you knock it out. And when you knock it out, you throw everything that you were paying on that smallest one towards the next smallest one till you knock it out. And you just keep doing that. You just keep doing that till you knock them all out, baby. And it works. It works. And you get that psychological boost and you start knocking off a bill over here, start knocking off a bill over there. And I mean, it begins to get real. You begin to see that you can do this and you begin to feel that freedom of having breaking free of the bondage of owing somebody else and being afraid at any given moment that you're going to lose your job or something and not be able to pay them. All right. Or that your health is going to kick in. Oh, I have so many clients that have these come and go conditions. Some days you feel good and some days you don't feel good. And some days you can work and some days you can't work. And I help them develop businesses so that they can work within the confines of their medical conditions. And, and even as they're working to improve those conditions, right? So that, so that if you, so that if you don't have three or four or five years of good days in a row, that you set up a business and an income stream that allows you to work with what you got right? But it's the more financially free you are, the easier it is to do that. Okay. It, it, you got all these bills. It's really hard for me to be able to help you craft something that's going to just be in line with your, with your medical conditions. And it's going to make your heart sing. And you're just going to be overjoyed. I mean, sometimes when we're in a deep situation, we just got to put the metal to the pedal and do a pedal to the metal and get the job done. All right. So the more you're free of debt, the more options you have. OK, so when it comes to prioritizing, when it comes to prioritizing your debt, that's how I would prioritize them. OK, I would make sure I cover my four walls if I can do that, but I can't pay my minimums. I would do a pro rata plan until I get to a point where I can at least pay something off. Right. If I, if I can pay my minimums, I pay the minimums on everything except the smallest one and throw all my extra money at the smallest one till I knock it out and rinse and repeat. All right. Great question. Great question. I love this. I love this. Next question. How much should I set aside for savings? Okay. Let me go ahead and cover that again. Just real, real quick. If you don't know how much you should have in savings during COVID, I actually think we should save more. We don't know what's going to happen as the spring progresses and, and we think things are going to get better, but we really don't know. I would seriously be socking away as much money as you could into your savings, unless you're financially free or financially independent. Okay. So what I mean by that is, let me, let me speak in, in normal terms. You're either at a point where you're either at a point where you control your income meaning you don't have to work. You can work where you were, you know, you can work and you can not work and still have what you need coming in, or you're at the point where you can not work and have what you want coming in. Okay. But, but if you're at the point where you're beholden to a job right now, I would still recommend saving as much as possible. And I didn't talk about this at the beginning, so I'm glad we're bringing this up now. I would still recommend that you save as much as possible because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if employers are going to start requiring you to have the vaccine before you can come to work. We don't know if everybody's going to want want to get it. And I'm not passing any judgment on people who got it or don't want to get it. I'm just saying I see a lot of people on both sides. And I know a lot of people are going to have a difficult time making a decision if they're not in a position to leave their job because their job wants them to have the vaccine and they want to wait and, and, and let it get tested on a few more people first. Right. And so there's 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 all kinds of different mindsets out there. And, and I try to help people prepare, you know, how much you save is dependent on your personal situation. Okay. So if your job might possibly go away in spring, or if your job might be at risk that you can't work there because you don't want to take a vaccine, or if your job might be at risk because the nature of the economy has been fundamentally changed forever, then you want to sock up more cash because you don't know what's coming down the pike. OK, now basic recommendations is when you are steeped in debt. OK, basic recommendations when you're steeped in debt, you will save at least five hundred to a thousand in some high income areas. I recommend two thousand, you know, just depending on your income levels. And then you and then once you're completely out of debt, you've got the three to six month savings. I personally think everybody needs a six month savings. Six months of expenses. What do you need to live on? Now I say six months of expenses. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that don't need to be in that. 
because you know if 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 I'm if I don't get any speaking gigs for six months, I don't need to buy another pair of lubes. Okay, I don't I don't need another pair. <laughs> that's not a that's not that's a business expense. It's not a necessity. Okay, so um, that's that's the kind of thing that we want to evaluate. I'd say at least three to six months. But again, with COVID, you know where you stand on things. You know how you want to live your life. If you are as many people as I see on Facebook, still a little bit unaware, still a little untrusting of this vaccine, I would recommend you stockpile some cash because I think I think change is coming. People are projecting that change is coming, and and I don't know for sure, but but I just want you to be prepared. Okay. All right. Let's um let's let's take a question from the uh, live audience today, and then we'll get back to the questions that have already been submitted. So this one here says, if you have a good business plan, are there loan companies that will offer you a loan even if you don't have an income right now? Okay. I am going to answer the question as stated, but before end around the question. I am going to say I am not a big fan of getting a business loan. And I know that flies in the face of so many people that, um, that, that, you know, you go get your, you go get your business, you go get your DNB, you start establishing your credit and then you take out lines of credit and that's how you grow and expand your business. And there's a reason most small businesses fail within the first five years. And one of the biggest reasons is too much debt. Okay. So, so I'm going to answer the question and the question is yes. If you have a solid business plan, there will be banks out there, companies out there, investors out there who will offer you a loan. But if you don't have any income, that may not be the route you want to take. Because you don't know what the market is going to bear and you don't know what's about to change over the next six months, 12 months. Okay. And so let me, let me just, um, let me just expand on this, on this point for a minute. Okay. So what do you, what do you need in a business plan? Okay. In a business plan, there's a couple different things that you put into a business plan. You're going to, you're going to talk about your research. You're going to talk about your competition. Like the, the people want to know that you've researched your competition. You know who you're up again against and you know your value prop proposition. Like people ask me, what makes you different from the other 8 million financial planners out there? Well, guess what this financial planner has done? I've gotten out of 800 something thousand dollars of debt. Not too many people can say that. All right. I did all that while being a single mom, active duty in the military. Not many people can say that. I invest in real estate without going into more debt. Not many people can say that. Not many people want to hear that. So I don't have, you know, I don't have any visions of grandeur that I'm going to have a super huge following or anything, but I sleep well at night and I'm the wasn't stressed at COVID because guess what? My people kept paying their rent. I took good care of them. They took good care of me and we all got things together. And even if, you know, I, I just, I just, um, a business plan is where you explain your difference. It's where you explain how you're going to grab some of the highly competitive market that you're going to be in. And when I put my first business plan together, I had all kinds of good stuff in there and I wasn't planning on getting a loan or anything, but you know, you go to these networking, these networking, um, things and you meet loan officers. And I wanted to know if I had a good business plan. So I would give my business plan out and they would review it. And time after time, after time, again, they would all focus in on how I was expecting to make money in the market. And in their opinion, each one of them, until I learned how to do this better, each one of them was like, your plan is not solid. You're very weak on how you actually expect to generate income. But I hadn't generated any income yet. I had been financial coaching for years, but it was always in a volunteer capacity. So I didn't know what I was doing to generate income. Okay. And so this is why it's essential that we really do our research. But if you have done your research, and you can put in your business plan that you have done your research, you'll find somebody to lend you some money. Okay. You will, you absolutely will. Cause people want to make money and they're going to lend you their money because you've shown them that you're going to bring it back as a return for them. I'm just not so sure that's really what you want to do. And we can talk about that offline. Okay. All right, y'all. I'm JJ Conway. Thanks for watching. Or if you're listening on podcast, I, I want to appreciate you all for being here. Y'all take care and be blessed. Love the podcast? Be sure to like, subscribe, and forward three friends. 
You can ask a question or take a life-changing class at buildingwealthtogether.com. Now, go walk in abundance and leave a legacy.